All right, yesterday I said that I would be talking about basically the modern literary movement. Um, and when I say modern literary criticism, these are the ones that I'm identifying primarily as formalist. Now, these aren't all the modern literary criticism traditions, but we'll be looking at a variety of different modern movements after this. But these are the two that I consider to be most definitively modern in terms of philosophy. Um, and I should talk really quickly about what I mean philosophically modern versus chronologically modern. Like, in strictly chronological terms, we use the adjective modern to describe things of the present day. But philosophically speaking, the term modern has a slightly different meaning. And this applies in basically all sort of the soft humanities disciplines. Um, so like in history, we call this the postmodern era. Um, philosophy, people who are adopting the current prevailing norms are generally considered postmodern, though there are movements other than postmodernism that are still around in philosophy. And what marks modernism is a mixture of what we might call enlightenment reason and skepticism. Um, and skepticism is basically this thesis that we probably don't know as much as we think we know. Um, and particularly, the modern skepticism is a sort of mod or moral skepticism. And when you're thinking about that, what that means is we see a move away from criticism that focuses on moral purposes in fiction. We also see less focus on things like um, what's the purpose of writing. Uh, either those questions are considered settled by some writers, um, but not all. Some of the formalists will talk about why people write certain ways, but it's more of an end goal rather than a meta goal. Like no one's writing about how art is this philosophical expression so much, and more people are focusing on, um, instead of going towards sort of the abstract philosophy, going for the practical, here's the method that we use to achieve this response. Um, I just wanted to talk about that really quick, because if I do not, then people will get confused. It's also worth noting that I call formalism structural as a form of criticism. I also refer to it, people who engage in it as structuralism. If you look up literary criticism, you will see a capital S structuralism. That is not what I'm talking about here. Um, I say structural because formalism looks at the structure of the text, how it's put together, how it's organized. Um, and it really springs out in, I think, 1916 is about when you're going to start seeing it. Coincidentally, World War I is going on at the time, and that's considered by many people to be the moral crisis that sparks modernity, um, as opposed to sort of the Enlightenment Romanticism era. Um, technically speaking, it probably begins a little before that, but it's not popularized yet. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. Um, personally, I think a good place to start the clock on modernity is with Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, now, I don't like a lot of Nietzsche's ideas. He's very provincial. He lacks understanding of sort of opposing theories to his own. But he has this idea of the death of God. And now Nietzsche is an atheist, but he's not... When he comes up with his idea of the death of God, he's not trying to say, hey, everyone should be an atheist. God doesn't exist. What he's saying is people no longer give God the weight that he used to have in their lives. And so... You know, coming from previously very Christian Europe, even in the Enlightenment, even in Romanticism, people placed a very high role on religion. Um, Romanticism was maybe more spiritual than strictly involved in organized religion. But that collapses. That's just gone at a certain point. Um, and Nietzsche sees this as something of a catastrophe. Um, and Nietzsche talks about sort of the need to found our own morality, um, which is coincidentally something that led to some pretty bad things. Um, Nietzsche didn't like the fascists um, as much as he sort of could see the movements brewing. He didn't like collective identities, but the fascists like Nietzsche 
um, Hitler loved Nietzsche. Um, he had some kind of dangerous ideas with regards to morality. But he also very much created that skepticism that's the hallmark of the modern age. And so with skepticism, and you're not able to say, well, the purpose of literature is to exalt the human spirit. Well, because what's the human spirit? You know, people are very much in disagreement about that, and it's no longer considered this high and noble otherworldly thing. Um, so people start thinking about literature as a science. Um, and we get sort of two forms of this. Um, Russian formalism, 1916 is, I believe, sort of the starting point for that. Um, obviously, some of the theories may come out a little bit earlier, but the like formal movement starts in 1916. Um, and it's more scientific. It does have a certain degree of quantification. Um, there's some really good Russian formalist stuff. Um, you'll sort of have to search it up because it's very obscure in the West. Um, but uh, folklore and whatnot get break broken down. Um, and their goal is to sort of figure out what makes literature literature. Um, what can we put together to make stories? What are the elements in stories? And you'll see that carried over in some of the other forms of criticism as well. They're very interested in sort of the underlying building blocks that go into literature. Um, new criticism is slightly later. It happens in the West. Um, I say it's more refined, but really part of that is because it lasts longer and has more people doing it openly. Um, the Russian formalist movement has some, again, really great thinkers. New criticism just has more and longer. Um, the Soviets have kind of a love-hate relationship with Russian formalism in the sense that a lot of the Russian formalists have serious difficulties under the Soviet Union of being able to do their work freely and openly because they don't focus on, like, the new socialist man. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get into Marxist literary criticism. Um, new criticism is, in many ways, sort of unopposed um, and has a longer tradition. Um, both of them get criticized as formalist movements for abandoning historical context, human elements, um, they assume that the subject and object of study, the reader and text are stable and independent forms rather than the products of the unconscious process of signification. In this case, signification is a fancy term that means being assigned meaning. Um, and so when we look at it that way, one of the things to think about when you think of formalism is that you do a lot of close reading, a lot of stuff like that. Um, oftentimes it's very focused on poetry, um, not exclusively, but... Um, well, actually, we should move on. Um, I'm going to talk really freely about the text, and I'll get into the question of whether modern criticism is structural. Um, T.S. Eliot is perhaps one of my favorite modern poets, um, and he is a structural critic, and it comes across in his poetry. Um, if you've ever read The Wasteland, um, he is tremendous at that. Um, The new critics have this approach that is structural in terms of the pieces that go onto the page. Um, later, the movement called structuralism is actually more about sort of structures of society, structures of history. Um, and so you want to be careful here. If you look up like structuralism, you're not going to find formalist movements, even though formalist movements are focusing on structure. Um, now let's talk some pros and cons. I forgot to put all the cons up on the slide, but pros of formalist approaches. Um, a scientific approach to literature can give some counterintuitive ideas. So what that means is when you're looking at things like a formalist, um, because you really break down bits and pieces, there are things that were maybe happening subconsciously or people weren't really thinking about that made it into the final work. And the formalists are very good about catching things that no one else really caught until they came along. Um, their focus on styles of writing and evolution outside a historical context is very important. And when I say historical context, what I mean is, um, and we'll talk about this again in Marxist criticism, is there are some critics who argue that works are sort of a product of their time. Formalists 
agree in a sense that they look at the different forms and styles of writing and look at their sort of like evolution over time, but they don't think about social factors. They don't think about, you know, stuff like that. They might, you know, if you were looking at like an epic, well, why is an epic built the way it is? Well, because it might be passed down in an oral tradition. So that is one strength is that it lets you sort of see how things develop over basically we have 2,500 years of literary hit- history um, where we can see pretty regular updates in literature. Um, formalists also really pay attention to conventions and elements of writing. One of the reasons why we teach a lot in sort of formalist styles in schools is because they make you a measurably better writer if you do formalist criticism. You're more likely to follow the rules, and then once you've learned how to follow the rules, you start playing around with the rules. Um, if you've ever taken a class on writing poetry, you've probably heard that piece of advice. It's almost a cliche that you learn the rules so that you can break the rules. Um, and some of that is the formalists being upset because they're prescriptivist, which means that they believe that everyone should follow the rules rather than descript- descriptivist, uh, descriptivist, which means that they just want to find the rules that exist and document them. Uh, some formalists back off from the prescriptivist prescriptivist approach, um, and they're more likely to do that, I think, in new criticism, though don't hold me to that because I'm not really as well-versed in Russian formalism because it's not as popular here in the West. Um, downsides of formalist approaches. Um, so if you're a formalist and you get something really exotic and really unusual that you're not really given any context to explore, it becomes very difficult for you. Um, Another thing is because of how styles and conventions change, um, even like across languages, if you're trying to do formalist approaches on texts that maybe come from a different language and have been translated, depending on the quality of the translation, it may or may not hold up for the same sort of criticism. Um, Another con, it doesn't really have as much of a focus on purpose, which is fine in the sense that criticism isn't required to have that. Um, And you'll see people like T.S. Eliot again, they can do an evaluation by setting up criteria that they want to measure. And that's how a lot of other critics who don't have sort of built-in value system uh, with regards to what makes good literature do it. But the lack of a structured value system is something that is worth paying attention to. Um, and another negative side to the formalist approach is as much as we use it in teaching to sort of get people started, formalism requires you to have a lot of expertise before you can even really do a qualified breakdown of a text. Um, it's not like say deconstructionism where you can learn some basic precepts and then apply them, uh, which is one reason why so much of deconstructionist criticism is mediocre. Um, so there's sort of a cost benefit there of on one hand, one downside is if you're a formalist, you really need to know your forms and structures and styles and terminology. Um, so if you're not really into formalism, your ability to do good formalist criticism is low. Um, however, if you're a writer or a reader, dabbing in, or dabbling in formalism is a very valuable tool to give you that basic background and understanding. All right. Next video will be on archetypal criticism where we're going to break down my personal favorite of all the methods. Um, we're going to go in sort of a in alphabetical order. And I'll do uh, archetypal criticism will be the last sort of single form video. And then we'll move on to having more forms per video. So I think we have maybe three more videos left in this series. Um, but anyway, archetypal criticism will be up tomorrow. And I will see you all then.